you have an incredible career path and it has, Mm -hmm. I mean, you chose philanthropy for Mm -hmm. the predominance of your career. I mean, I went back and you had God's house, you had the center for success, the school Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lark saw, I mean, it is just riddled with, Mm -hmm. you know, amazing philanthropy work. What gave you that call to lead? Mm -hmm really how the community showed up for me as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, I was abandoned as a baby um, by my biological mother and um, a woman stepped up and adopted me. Um, I'm biologically biracial and uh, my white mother left me at the hospital. Um, And part of her decision-making process was her family was pressuring her really to not bring a black baby home. Oh. And so I went into foster care just only for a few months when um, my file came across a lady's desk who had a niece that wanted to adopt another baby. She had already adopted one mm-hmm. and um, it was a black woman and she took me in and she was never married and um, decided that she wanted to have children, but um, physically couldn't. And so she went the adoption route. And um, she lived with her mother and it was like I had two mothers growing up. Mm -hmm. And so these amazing black women took me into their home. Um, The community embraced me, Um, our neighbors, like um, it was really like, I remember just going to the local community center that was directed by our neighbor, Frank Bellamy. He was the director Mm -hmm. of Carver Center and going there and you know, my aunt lived across the street and just people were there for me, mm-hmm. showed up for me, gave me paths of, um, up, 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 of opportunity and saw me and, you know, held me accountable. <laughs> right? Like, I see you, sissy, you better get home. The street lights are on, you know. So it was really about the community kind of stepping up and taking care of this little no-named baby, right? Mm-hmm. Like I was left at the hospital And then I was delivered to this home, this loving home and this loving community that really stepped up for me. So I would have to say that giving back and the, and living a life that's philanthropic comes from a place of receiving first. Like I really needed, you know, I was a helpless newborn baby. And and I think, I think living that experience and knowing my story, like my mom was very honest about my story and knowing that. Um, when I became a young adult, I just had a heart to show up for those folks that were on some of the furthest of margins in society. Mm -hmm. And so then meeting my husband and then he was just really passionate about, um, starting his own church and, and, and not just being just, just another church, but like, how are we going to be inclusive for all people? Mm -hmm. And that really resonated with me. And we just kind of teamed up. We got married, teamed up, and decided to pursue really creating um, a place that was loving of all people because that's kind of what happened for me, like even as a child, a baby. I could see just even the the gratitude in your voice and in your eyes with your story. And I think, it, you know, it, you could go kind of two ways, I think, with that path, maybe one of resentment you know, and bitterness and kind of taking that out on the world. And then one more of inclusion and gratitude and saying, you know, it may have started out this way and forgiveness imagine happened along the way. And, and let me extend my hand. Do you think, did you ever feel out of, uh, out of place with being biracial as far as not fitting in with the white girls over here and the black girls, you weren't black enough. Was that a struggle for you growing up? Oh my gosh. Yes. Like I was born in 1972. So, you know, late seventies, early eighties, I was in school, went to school and, and, you know, there were not little girls that looked like me. Um, I was kind of, you know, this, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, and so even in my neighborhood, um, you know, there was one other little girl, right? Like there, there were not little girls that looked like me and, um, you know, people would say stuff about that, not in a mean way, right? not intentionally being cruel, but, um, you know, one specific story I remember being in, we used my sister, she's full black. Um, 
and darker skinned, um, you know, different texture of hair. And we were like walking down our little alley by our house and um, some teenage girls, black girls were at the end of the alley stopped us. And they were just like, oh, just doting over me. Like, you're so pretty and touching my hair, which was re- felt really weird. I was just like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like an experiment on yeah, display. I was just like, who, yeah. are you, who are these people? And they were just like, oh, you're so pretty. You're so pretty. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, just all this, all these like compliments. But I just remember so vividly being in that moment, um, feeling like, like I started shrinking in that moment Mm. because my sister who is gorgeous, beautiful. And who you looked up to. It's completely like we were partners in crime. Like that was my like road dog. Like she's my best friend, even to this day, gorgeous, lovely, smart, intelligent being is standing right beside me and they aren't even acknowledging her. And I remember when I look back on that, that's when I learned how to shrink. That's when I learned, I started, I began learning how to be small and play small and show up small. Did you recognize it was because of race? Because you were biracial? In that that moment, I just was like, this is weird. Mm -hmm. And then there were several, you know, it just kind of compounded. There were so many of those situations. And then I remember being in second grade, going to school the the first day of school and sitting beside a little white girl. I wasn't thinking she was white. It was just a little girl. We bonded. She loved my eraser. I was so excited. Told my mom about it. Went back the next day. Was like, I have a friend. And she literally told me, I cannot be your friend. I cannot play with you because my mom said you're black. And in second grade. Yeah. And so... I was pretty aware pretty early that the color of my skin mattered, whether it was because it was lighter or because it was darker. Mm -hmm. And so I, and being abandoned as a baby, um, kind of having a little bit of that story as I got older, understanding, I did wrestle with a sense of belonging. Um, And while I belonged to my family, I knew my mom loved me, my grandmother, my sister, there was a sense of belonging inside the four walls of my home. And even mm-hmm. within the black community, there was a sense of belonging that was created for me, but there was still that part of me that was like, I don't know that I quite fit here. And I think I kind of fit here, <laughs> but there was this inner kind of wrestling of like, really, where do I belong? And, and I have to say the black community, um, is is my community right like it's right. it's where i have found the most belonging right like my sense of belonging but it was a challenge as a little a little tyke mm-hmm. running around the neighborhood and going to school and and being different and my mom is a black woman she was never married she was not outwardly gay back then but she's a gay woman and so that that yeah. you know there was some whispers about that and talk about that and so that was It was challenging growing up and trying to kind of find my way and not feeling like I um, sometimes fit in in Mm -hmm. certain spaces and places for sure. Did your faith have an impact kind of as you and your husband connected and, you know, working within that church? Did that give you that continuation, that sense of community? Yeah, I mean, I definitely started my spiritual journey in my 20s before I met him, my early 20s, mm-hmm. kind of on a path of of discovering like what does spirituality spirituality look like for me? And I, we weren't raised in church as kids. Like my grandmother mm-hmm. took us like on holidays, Easter, Christmas, you know, some of Mother's Day, but we didn't go regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, and while I believe to my core, my grandmother and my mother are very spiritual people. It just wasn't like a a weekly practice. Um, So there was, there was some of that growing up kind of curiosity and like, huh, I wonder like what that's about. And so in my early twenties, I really started to explore that. And I started attending a church, a local church and really finding meaning and belonging. Um, um, it was a very diverse community, um, the church that I was attending in my hometown and um, just people really showing up for me and loving me. And 
that was a, felt very pure and authentic and it felt good. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of began my path to spirituality. And, and then of course I met my husband through the church, like he, his sister attended and she's like, oh my gosh, you should meet my brother. And I was like, no, I don't really like men. Like, I'm not doing that. And she's like, oh, yeah, you really <laughs> I'm over that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then we met and he's just been a phenomenal person to be in partnership with. And we've been married for 24 years. But when I met him, like he, he was different. Like he, he was kind of like me, like I, I'm on this faith journey, but it's a journey that includes all people, right? Like I want to invite as many people to the table, regardless of their backgrounds, where they're at, their sexuality, their, like all of that, like, it doesn't yeah. matter. Like we want to be inclusive to all people. And that's kind of what, where I was. And so we kind of like, as we got married, realized like, oh, we kind of had the same heart in that, that we want to create a place for people to just invite everybody to the table. Everybody has a seat. Everybody has a place. Everybody has a voice. Which is, you know, interesting because I mean, organized religion in its whole is pretty exclusive and not as inclusive. And some were Jewish and I've seen the reform movement really make an effort to be inclusive, mm -hmm. um, but it's not necessarily the norm. Right. Yeah. You know, that tends and to that's be... something that my husband and I tried to, um, to kind of be the opposite. And we got ridiculed. We were not yeah, but... the local religious community pastors. We didn't have a lot of friends in that community because we did really, truly accept all people, um, whether you were, you know, we had a transgender person that came to our right. church and we baptized them. And I mean, the letters that we got from the and not pastor. present day, we're talking about before yeah, you know, we're talking, transgender was coming out. We're yeah. talking 10, 10 years ago, yeah. you know, right. you know, people that were um, coming out, kids that were coming out as, you know, they, they were saying, Hey, I'm gay. Can I come to your church still? My, you know, I can't go to my parents' church. Oh, I just got like, chills. And we're like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can come. Yeah, here. And I, and what I would do as a co-pastor, I'm sitting on the front row. I'm like, you come and you sit by me. Yeah. Like you, and you're going to come to lunch with us afterwards. And we're going to, you know, and so being those people, um, we weren't popular with the religious right. community. And I'm very proud of that. I mean, yeah, no, I think that's day, the good thing. <laughs> even to this day, I'm like, we did that. Like we went against the grain. Like we really challenged um, what inclusive meant, like what love meant, what grace meant. And um, I feel very, I feel very good about that. and very proud about that. And, and really seeing people, um, fully, you know, as their truest, most authentic self and not wanting or expecting them to be different, but just saying, Hey, come to the table, just as you are, you're welcome at God's house. This is the type of culture we have and community that we have. And I feel very proud that we did that. And, and you mentioned the religious, you know, s Christianity specifically kind of being exclusive. I mean, since we've transitioned out of that work, which we transitioned not because anything happened. We just felt like it was time for us to move on to do something else. Um, you know, I haven't found a place because I'm just like, <laughs> can't find yeah. another God's house. And have really had a, um, uh, you know, kind of a reckoning with my own faith, a deconstruction of my faith. And, mm -hmm. and so I... I'm in a really interesting place now where I, I feel like, you know, I'm a very spiritual person, but I'm not really attached to a specific religion anymore. And, and that's okay. You know, I'm like, I feel really good about that journey as well. And, and where I'm at today and how I'm still doing that um, kind of philanthropy, reaching out, connecting with people, partnering with people in their well being. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and transferring all of this, I mean, your, your big word is inclusion, you know, even in that work with, with God's house and now transferring over and this fight to end systemic racism mm -hmm. and really seeing people, you know, I, like I said, I, 
we're Jewish, but I came from like a yogic background in spirituality. Mm. And I, even as a kid, you know, I didn't know that like Christmas had to do with Jesus. I was like, who's Jesus? Yeah. And I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but my mom was interesting. She, you know, brought Jehovah's Witnesses to our house. And, you know, we learned about Egyptian religion and it was just kind of like this weird earth muffin. And then, you know, I, I never really found myself in an organized religion and found spirituality and through yoga and through meditation, that's where I found my connection to God, mm -hmm. you know, and that belief that we really are all connected yeah. and that we're all one. I mean, this is just our frame. This is our shell that we're carrying around, right? It's temporary. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, that systemic racism, and we kind of talked about that when we chatted earlier, is basically everyone looking around and saying, you know, not me. Well, I'm not racist, so mm -hmm. this isn't an issue. And then everybody's just kind of turning to the other person, and then we're just ignoring the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we fight something where, where individuals don't believe exist? Yeah. <laughs> what a you, question. Right. I mean, what a question. You're yeah, like and I think, this. yeah, I think that, that when you, when, just even saying that phrase, when there's people that don't even think it, it exists, folks that don't think it exists have lived a very privileged life. They don't think it exists because they've not experienced it, lived it, or are connected with or in deep relationships with people who have. And so, um, you know, we have to recognize that it is systemic racism is, a, it's real and it has oppressed black and brown people for many, many, many years. None of us that are alive today created it. We didn't build it. And so we have to kind of accept that it's- But it's, it's being baked. fueled. Yeah. And we it's didn't build the car, but it's being fueled. Yeah, exactly. It's baked into our systems. It's baked into our country, the way we've set it up. We, if we travel back in history and do our due diligence to look at true history, America was built on the back of slaves on the back of black people, free labor. Like we are the country that we are because years and years and years and years, we, we built things, industries, created things on the backs of black people, free labor. So we got ahead because we went and had to pay nobody. So, right. so systemic racism is a real issue that no, we didn't create, we didn't build, but we do up either uphold or we tear down. And if we continue to say, I'm not racist, I'm not racist, I'm not racist, it's just sitting in neutral. And while that may be true, that's not helping the cause. And so by saying that, you're- it's like being an choosing, accessory. Yeah, <laughs> right. it, it, absolutely. You're, you you're didn't choosing. kill the person, but you stood by and watched it. Right, right. Or, or, or choosing to turn a bl blind eye to what's real. And a, and a lot of times, you know, if you live in a neighborhood, if you, you were able to kind of not be privy to what happens in predominantly black or poor communities, then you get to say, well, system racism is not real. <laughs> well, you get to say that because you didn't, you're not, you know, experiencing it. Right. So or the that, only black family you knew was at the private school and, right. you know, that's all you've been exposed to. And you've right. never seen even a disparity in classes because everybody's right. pretty much status quo. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important for us to um, really, first of all, acknowledge that like it is a real thing. Um, there are disparities um, because of systemic racism and then choose to practice anti-racism or uphold systems of oppression that white non-people of color benefit from and people of color, black folks, brown folks um, are hurt, harmed and killed by. It's not just that we don't benefit, right? It's not like, oh, the systems right. benefit non-people of color, good for them, we don't benefit. No, it's not that we don't benefit, it's that we are oppressed, hurt, harmed and killed as we saw play out in all of our news feeds this spring mm -hmm. and summer with George Floyd, killed by. And so it's important for us to, for everybody, we need all hands on deck 
in dismantling systemic racism. And that requires us to be involved, to have a voice, to get educated, um, to really begin to do our own work of unpacking our own biases and then being equipped to challenge our neighbor, our family member at the Thanksgiving table, our coworker at the water cooler who is showing up and saying things inappropriately um, that, that is upholding um, systemic racism. Like we, there are practical things that we can do um, to do the work of really cultivating an anti-racism practice in our own life. And I call it a practice because it's not a like two-day workshop and I'm an anti-racist or a book I read, oh, I'm an anti, it's really, really like when we talk about meditation, emotional well-being yeah. practices, it's the same thing. We have to begin to weave these types of practices into our lives, our daily lives, so that we can begin to play a role in dismantling systems that we benefit, that, that white non-people of color benefit from and that black, brown people of color are ultimately killed by, right? Yeah. And a practice also allows you that growth for evolution and know that it's always changing and that it's fluid and what may be working uh, for you today within that framework has to have that ability to grow and shape as the times change. Absolutely. I mean, it's like with, it's like with anything else, like we have to be open to the journey and um, that that journey, you know, expands, it grows, it changes, it evolves. And I think we live in a society that is, is built around um, perfectionism and getting right. things right. And you're not going to get this right. Like we have to be open. Right. To it's not a it pass or yeah. There's a lot of gray area, but at least we need that forward momentum. We have to begin yeah. to take steps. And I think that understanding that I'm not going to get this right all the time, um, and I have to um, really give myself room to grow and room and grace, and also be willing to take correction as a non-person of color, as a white person, right? From black folks, from brown folks to say, that's, that actually isn't appropriate or that you said that and that, that still is offensive. And instead of being defensive or like, I'm trying and here's the list of things that I'm doing for black people. <laughs> and I just got a DM about that over the weekend. And I oh, was I imagine. like, like, that's not the point. The point is when you stumble, when you fumble, when is to take correction and keep it moving, right? We have to be willing to take that correction. We have to be willing to evolve. We have to be willing to change. We have to be willing to, to really lay down our pride and say, like, I'm gonna be on the side of dismantling and that's not, it's messy. If you think about a building yeah. being knocked over, like there's nothing clean and neat and perfect about that. A building being bulldozed is messy, it's dusty, it's a wreckage, it's a mm -hmm. reckoning, right? And so that's, we have to be willing to be open, to be wrong, to get it wrong, to mess up, to take correction and to, and to continue to still show up in the fight for ultimately black and brown liberation. I mean, like that's what it's about right. at the end of the day. Right, and I think too, as a white person, there's a vulnerability that has to come through to be able to get that correction, right? So you have to be able to be comfortable enough to make mistakes, to be called out on them, mm -hmm. you know, and then to move forward. And I think people lack, the majority of people lack the mindfulness skills to even be self-aware enough yeah. to, to lay that on the table, yeah. to either know, Absolutely. to make the decision of, or I'm, I'm comfortable making mistakes or I'm not. I mean, most people just walk around completely glazed over, isolated in their, you know, very white privileged bubble without being able to even see outside of that. Yeah. Even the gratitude for the path that they've had and the reckoning of the path that others around them are having. And people, I mean, they just don't even see it. Right. Yeah. You're you know, right. and that's where mindfulness, you know, we, I love your app, Exhale, and mm -hmm. you, it's mindfulness techniques specifically for Black, Indigenous women of color, which is a long time Sorry. coming. I can oh. only call one person. Series column. <laughs> Series button in. <laughs> and it's, you know, we talked about this a little bit, just that the yogic space, which was a brown space, a brown male space for 5,000 years. It wasn't white women's space. 
but it's tools that we need in life and mindfulness and that it has not been a space for people of color Mm -hmm. and that, you know, they walk past the yoga space or the yoga studio or maybe interested, but don't see themselves in it. And so not even knowing that these tools and resources are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like most industries, you know, they're predominantly white owned, white curated, white created, um, you know, dominated by white folks. And so um, it's an industry that needs a reckoning as well. Mm -hmm. That really, um, like you mentioned, (laughs) brown people cultivated, created, right? These types of practices. And again, has been kind of hijacked. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. By white women in Lululemon pants. (laughs) Right. I mean. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. It's so true. And, and, and because of that, it's not that black women, brown women, women of color aren't pursuing well-being or Mm -hmm. don't want to pursue those types of practices. It's just when we show up in those spaces and those places, when they're predominantly white, predominantly white led, um, because of that, there it's, there's a white lens that's that's kind of things are being operated from that place which means when I show up I'm not going to be fully seen Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be fully heard um and there's a level of stress that we all experience levels of stressors depending on you know our life and how we were raised all the things we all have stressors But the truth is black indigenous women of color and those that have gender identities oppressed by racism and misogyny have um, stressors, compounded stressors because of racism. And so when I come into a space that's all white and there's a part of me that's not even acknowledged, that's problematic because my well-being includes my oppression as well. Like that has to be talked about Mm -hmm. and addressed and worked through um, so that I can have a, a, a true path of well-being as a black woman, as a brown woman, as a woman of color. And so when those spaces don't talk about that or there's not representation, there's not a black yoga instructor at the front of the room ever. Um, there's not a black person or a brown person at the desk welcoming me as I come. If I don't see anybody black or brown, it's problematic. And we still show up in those places bravely, yeah. right? We still right, show you're up taking- and we still try to show up, but there is, there is a chance um, that we can be even harmed in the things that are said or not said um, if they're predominantly white spaces. Sure. You yeah. know, in a space of, of well-being and just wellness in general, which we all need. I mean, we need a whole bunch of white people to really get on the mindfulness train as well. I mean, then that's the lack of vulnerability for, for lack of a better word, the lack of vulnerability or willing to make mistakes or willing to acknowledge our own path in this, our own doing. Mm -hmm. People need that mindfulness to even get self-awareness. You know, I started this membership for moms to try to give them the mindfulness tools to even just look, to be able to look outside of themselves back in and be like, what's going on here in my life? Am I happy? Am I sad? I mean, people don't even know anything in their life or how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then then we see these things on the news and they're like, well, that doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Oh, that was over there. Mm -hmm. And they're able to completely detach from everything going on around them because they're not even in tune with what's going on inside themselves. Exactly. I mean, that's the important journey of mindfulness. Um, Or we get so distracted with our problems and our issues and not knowing how to manage our own stress that we may see you know, something happened that is like a total injustice, but because we don't even know how to journey back to our own self and manage our own stuff, like our internal stuff, stress, anxiety, Mm -hmm. our own trauma, right? Um, Right. Then we can't be someone that reaches across or someone that shows up and says, well, I want to advocate for this, these people, because they're not even advocating for themselves. Right. And And I've not really gone on that path of forgiveness for themselves to even be able to move past that. Yeah, exactly. And I would say that it's not about, 
I have to do this before I can do that, right? Like it's not about, oh, I need to be more mindful before I can um, show up in advocate in advocacy or allyship or accomplish it, accomplish mm-hmm. be an accomplice for black and brown people. But it is a both and like we have to begin to journey kind of like you talked about a mindfulness kind of turning in mm-hmm. and realizing that I've got to do some healing work. And as we do that, I believe if we're doing it, like really doing it, that it leads to advocacy, right. that it leads to allyship. Because you begin to realize, like you said earlier, we're all connected. Mm -hmm. So if one of us is suffering, right? If there's a segment of society that is suffering and being oppressed, ultimately, I am. Ultimately, we all are, right? I think it was Fannie Lou Hamer that said, you know, nobody's free until we're we're all free. Like, until everybody has true liberation, there's a part of me that's not liberated. And so as I'm journeying and doing mindfulness practices and mindfulness work, it should lead to inclusivity. It mm-hmm. should begin to take blinders off and, me, and for me to see my own privileges and my biases and areas where I'm upholding systems of oppression and where, where can I begin to kind of play a role in dismantling systems of oppression? Like it should lead to that. It should be a part mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. Like it's not, and we have to get out of this kind of mindset. That's all about me. It's all about me. It's all, it's not all about us. Right. Like, and it, that's or I hard. have to do, yeah, I have to do this first. You know, let me just go, I got to go do this first and then I'll, then I'll deal with that. I know that's out there, but it, you know, let me just go do this. Because part that's part. privilege. Right. You get to do that. <laughs> right. you know, I don't like I leave this house as a brown woman, right? Like yeah. I don't get to not be brown. Like right, like, black folks don't get to not be black, right? Like that's privilege in saying like, well, I don't have to deal with that. What an uproar this summer! Oh, I just I don't yeah. I I can't because I have to do this. Is privileged like that Absolutely. in itself is white privilege, and so I mm-hmm. think that we have there's a reckoning. It's not this is like. It's like, take a deep breath and let's tear it down, right? It's a lot. It's a lot of work. But we have to keep the focus in, when we think about anti-racism, the focus is Black and brown liberation. It's not about me being perfect or right or seen as a good person. It's not about me being good, a good person or a bad person, racist, not racist. That's irrelevant. It is about Black liberation. And what are you doing to play a role in that because if Mm -hmm. if if black specifically black women (laughs) brown women are some of the most marginalized people in our society trans women some of the most marginalized um if they're liberated we all are Mm -hmm. we all are if we can do the work to liberate those folks that are on the furthest of margins then we're all free it's a domino effect right yeah, I think it's really important to to continue to say and to and let people know it it doesn't need to be perfect. And, and going back to that, people are paralyzed with. I mean, even as mothers, it's either you're an A parent mm-hmm. or you're an F parent. I'm like, no, there's a whole lot of grades in the middle. Mm-hmm. You know, you can you can be a C mom and still be doing a good job. You yeah. know, if that's what the resources that you had today, and we as a culture in a society, we are either killing it with A's or we're failing miserably. And yeah. there's a whole bunch in between that can still be projected forward, that we could still have movement. It doesn't have Absolutely. to be set pass fail and, and giving people the platform just... to make mistakes. Absolutely. Like we've been culturally conditioned that we're either good or bad. Right. Right. We're doing it right or we're doing it wrong. And there's so much space in between. That's actually not true. We're human beings. We have a whole slew of stuff that's happened to us, like a journey, a life journey that's gotten us to where we are. We're actually very resourceful people. We're creative people. We're whole people. We're relational people. We're valuable. We're unique, right? And we can't, can, we have to break that cultural conditioning that tells us we're either good or bad, right or wrong, A or F, because there's a lot at play every day, right? Mm-hmm. And really giving ourselves grace 
to say it's not about being good or bad. It's not about getting it right or wrong. It's about showing up fully and authentically as myself today and doing the best damn job I can do today. Considering this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. How can I show up fully today authentically and do my best today and love myself through that? And at the end of the day, pat myself on the back and be like, you did that thing. That was really hard. Right? You showed up and homeschooled your kids and you ain't been trained to homeschool. Right. Right? Are you like, you did that. Like you, right. like you, like really lo- like, and my, that's part of mindfulness, it, mindfulness, it's turning in and really loving ourselves showing up for ourselves, how we show up for everybody else, how we keep showing loving our kids, loving our partners, right? Our family. How are we doing that for ourselves? And how are we showing ourselves grace? And how are we giving ourselves room to just be, right? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean we don't show up and do the thing, right? Like we have to still do the work. We have to still, you know, show up as the mom, whatever at work, whatever the role is, but give yourself love, give yourself grace, give yourself room to, to not be perfect. There is no mm-hmm. perfect person. We're all flawed people, right? Yeah. We, and, we, and we have to give ourselves room to be flawed and to yeah. not get it right. Through exhale, giving black and brown women that language, I can't imagine how impactful that has been from a oppressed culture of women to hear at the end of the day, you are enough just as you are. I mean, that has to be tenfold. Oh my gosh. The feedback that we've been getting has been beautiful. So yeah, Excel is an emotional well-being app for black indigenous women of color. And I got the idea to create it in April in the midst of um, being quarantined. I had lost over half my business as a coach and a public speaker that, that kind of all came to a screeching halt. And I was managing my own stress and just trying to figure out like what's next for me. And, you know, there was so much uncertainty, as you can remember during that time, like the world just literally shut down. That's never happened in our lifetime. And we were, everybody was like, what's next? And, um, and then of course the killings of Ahmaud Aubrey started, you know, his killing George Floyd, Breonna Taylor start playing out in our news feeds and in the news cycle. It was just super stressful. Mm-hmm. And I could feel this collective weight of my community, the black community, and, and really a sense of hopelessness because yeah. I know that this oppression exists. I know that there's police brutality. I know that there's disparities, um, but COVID exasperated op- yeah. the oppression. And it was a level of stress that I'd never experienced. And I just was like, I have to do something to show up for my community. Like, I really felt this tug to like, Katara, how are you showing up for your community and what can you do? And then the, the idea for Exhale App came in April. I went to work writing content, pulling content from places that stuff I'd already created, med- writing meditations, and then launching it four months later in August. and really, really, truly wanting it to be a resource for us, by us, um, that had representation, that there's black and brown voices on the app, leading meditations, leading Mm -hmm. um, guided breath works, guided visualizations, coaching talks, and also visually having a black model, like Mm -hmm. opening up the app and a black woman, brown woman, brown woman seeing themselves reflected back to them was really important to us. And um, releasing it as a, a resource for us during, especially during that time was really um, important to me. And the feedback that I've gotten back has been just overwhelmingly beautiful and wonderful. Um, just women saying things like, you know, I didn't know how bad I needed something like this until I started yeah. using it or Um, Another lady said, just opening the app and seeing a black woman on a wellness app gave me so much life and gave me this sense of like, I can trust this space, hearing someone talk about my oppression, because we have, we have several meditations where I address our oppression, like our, the microaggressions that we go through that we experience and getting that trauma and stress out of our bodies, like hearing women say like, 
I needed that. Like I experienced this at work today or I couldn't sleep at night and I put on, you know, your sleep meditation. Now I'm sleeping. It's just, and I found out recently, I don't look at the analytics on our app Mm -hmm. because I just don't want to get consumed with that kind of stuff. But I recently I've been doing some work for an accelerator program that I'm in for small or black owned businesses. And we're in 45 countries. Oh yeah. The app is in 45. I just like found out that information last week. I'm like, what? Like we're in Kuwait yeah. and Indonesia and uh, Jamaica and Japan and um, Australia. And like, we're all over the place. I'm like, yeah. what? And so there's women, it's a global movement where black and brown women of color are coming to exhale because I believe the the biggest reason is because they can see and hear themselves. And it's somebody that understands their oppression because I've walked through it. I've experienced it. Um, and I can speak to it. And I think that there's something really powerful in representation and seeing ourselves reflected back to us as a mirror. Um, so it's been, it's been an amazing thing. I've, I created it. It was a lot of work, but it has given me, it, it's giving me so much back as I'm like creating stuff for people. It just keeps giving back to me in ways that have been super lovely and beautiful and surprising. Um, it's been refreshing for me as well as the creator of it. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Congratulations. I mean, it's gotta be that ripple effect, you know, that, that small, you know, disruption in the water and you notice that it's transferring over the whole world. Like that is incredible. Yeah. Super. And what a need for that. You know, Mm -hmm. the fact that there hasn't been mindfulness in general, hasn't been part of our culture as a country. Mm -hmm. for, you know, maybe the past decade, but to not have anything available for black and brown women to see themselves. I mean, I pull up, I have Budify, I have, you know, and they're just usually English speaking because those are sexier voices, but white people. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, that those are the apps I reached for in April, in March, I was reaching for those apps. And as I as you know, when George Floyd happened, when the killing of George Floyd happened, um, I can't even tell you, like th- my stress level um, and the black community stress level was unprecedented. Like my hair was falling out to be super vulnerable. Like it, I was like, what is going on? Are they killing us off? Like what's happening? Right. You know? Like, and it's, it wasn't like, I don't know that this stuff happens, but I think that watching it play out in our news feeds over and over and over again, the news cycle and and hearing how people were responding in awe and shock. And then the DMs as a black woman from white people, what can I do? Like that was stressful. Like Mm -hmm. it was a lot. And so um, just feeling that level of hopelessness was like nothing I had ever experienced, we had ever experienced in our, in our lifetime. And so it was really, really, really important for me to um, create something that I was actually looking for because those apps in real time, that stress, my hair falling out was just saying things that seemed out of step with where the black community was in real time. And it's not that those apps are bad, Right. Because right. they, they have been a resource for me. I've meditated with them for years. Right. They've been some of those apps have been part of my well-being. But in real time as a black woman, they were out of step and out of touch with my level of um, anxiety, stress and trauma and oppression, to, to be honest. And so I was like, well, I can't be the only one <laughs> searching right. for something to speak to me right now as I'm watching these things play out right and on my phone or in the, in the news cycle, like I cannot be the only one. And so I began asking my black friends, my sister, family members, my kids, and they were like, yeah, yeah, this is rough right now for us. Mm -hmm. And, and to hear, you know, you know, different apps just be like, you know, this, and, and, you know, not to slam them, they record those meditations months, and right, months right. in advance. Like I get it, but it was a kind of a glaring, like, it was like, 
you know, lights were flashing like, Katara, you need to create something that you're looking for. And so that's literally what I did is I just created something that I needed um, during that time. And really, it's not just that time, like we need it ongoing, right? And so Mm -hmm. I created, I created a resource that I was looking for. Yeah, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff over the summer, I've always found a try to explain the Holocaust to my children. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and even probably before this year, couldn't ever imagine how something like that could Mm -hmm. have happened. You know, how could, you know, millions of people go along with, with murdering, you know, 6 million Jews and gays and gypsies? How could that, this is how it could happen. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and it was very, very scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how do we as parents inform our children? You know, how do we communicate? with them systemic racism and explain to them in a way that they can understand. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's some amazing resources out there. Okay. Um, one of my friends, Layla Saad, Layla F. Saad, S-A-A-D, wrote a book called Me and White Supremacy. Um, it's a 28 day challenge. So it's not just a book you read, it's a book you do. Um, she's also writing one for teens that they can work through that should be coming out. I think it's coming out this year. Um, There's also several other resources, which I can send you and maybe you can put in the info of of this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So many resources out there for us to sit down with our kids and learn together because, Mm -hmm. you know, we've, history has been whitewashed and we all sat in history classes and learned a teeny tiny bit about black history. Um, which is American history. And we learned a tiny snippet. And then we think the civil rights movement happened and it all got better and it went away. And that's just really not true that there's, there's also not just a history of oppression in the black community, but a history of success and entrepreneurs and flourishing and movements and people leading movements, women leading movements, women who were involved in um, the civil rights movement that d- aren't named, that you can go back and like research history with your children. And so I think that sometimes we feel like we can't teach our kids because we don't know. Right. And the important thing that I would say is just because you don't know, doesn't mean you can't learn with your kids and just being super honest and vulnerable and saying, we didn't learn true history in school. We mm-hmm. didn't. And some of our, right. and our kids aren't, to be frank, like we really aren't digging into American history, which includes black history. And so really sitting down and just Googling it and Mm -hmm. reading about it and, and doing Layla's book and other books that are out there by black authors, by black people. My friend, Christina Platt writes um, black children's books for black and brown kids, but she calls them window and mirror books. So it's a mirror for black and brown kids to see themselves, but also a window for white kids to look in and see a different culture and see people that don't look like them reflect it back to them as well. And so mm-hmm. I think it's important and, and we have to be intentional about it because it's not like readily available, right? It's not going to be in your kid's history class necessarily. It's right. not going to be on the magazines at the store and you can just easily talk about it. It has to be intentional and it takes work, work and intentionality. Um, But I think it's important to have those conversations if you want to raise kids that are going to be a part of um, dismantling systemic racism, dismantling systems of oppression or upholding it and living a privileged life. Like you can raise kids that are true, that they really practice and become accomplices with the black community, with the brown community. And I think it's important that we teach our kids that, that, but don't let not knowing stop you, right? right? Like learn with them. And I think it's, and I will definitely put resources in the show notes and having a a membership and a community of moms, you know, giving them a place to say, okay, this is how let's learn alongside, you know, and it's okay not to know. I mean, we don't know anything as parents anyway. I mean, most of the time, (laughs) why is we're winging it? We're winging it on the DL. Like we look, we're we're trying to make it look real slick and good, but we are so winging it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, we, we do not know as moms. Exactly. And so this is just one more thing that we mm-hmm. can, can learn alongside. Absolutely. I think that's really beautiful. Absolutely. 
Oh, this has been really amazing, Katara. I really appreciate it. Oh, so fun. What a pleasure getting to just yeah. chat with you and being a part of what you're doing. And I love that you reached out and, and just wanted to have a true raw conversation, um, unfiltered and just like, let's dig in and talk about the stuff. Let's talk about the thing, you know, yeah. I think and I th I, these conversations need to be had. When I think there, you know, I, for me, it was one of those where I was probably most nervous. And I realized the nerves come from systemic racism because I don't want to look like a racist. It's like, that is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> right you don't so want to look either. bad that's right. that that's the whole that's like issue, we right? can't worry about, yeah yeah like don't, so don't want to rip bad. the band-aid off right yeah because we're all white people are looking around well you know i'm not a racist so they're clearly not talking about me and we're not asking the good questions we're not putting yeah. ourselves out there because yeah. we're too afraid to set our ego aside and be like i don't know let mm -hmm. i want to know let me teach me you know, I don't know. And I'm okay to be ignorant to, you know, the plights of people because I'm not in their shoes and I, I want to know. And that's, I yeah. think, empathy and vulnerability. That's it. And, yeah. and humility. Mm -hmm. and humility. Yeah. We have to, we have to really sh keep showing up that way. And I like to say, you know, for me, I, you know, it's not about creating safe places for black and brown people. It's about creating brave spaces. And if we're creating, and I learned this from, um, a person that I had on one of my podcast episodes, McKinsey Mack, and they, they talk about brave spaces. And if we can create brave spaces, then non-people of color and people of color can show up to, to a space that's brave because sure. that means I can show up fully authentically as myself and that there's room for me to get it wrong and to make mistakes and to fall and to stumble and to, you know, say something wrong, but be open to correction and if we can create those spaces for all of us to show up to that are brave, I think that we'll have a better world. No, I love that. And to be able to see yourself and others as they truly are. Absolutely. That, that is, that is brave. Yeah. It's incredible. Thank you so very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. Hopefully we'll be able to go have a coffee or a glass of wine or something later when the world comes back together. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks.